Interesting that uh, you have these um, enormous social programs. We're seeing them in Australia too, and probably right across the West, anti-bullying being one of them. This is sort of really quite almost the state taking over the role of the parents in some ways, deciding that certain things should be, you know, pushed, other things should be decried. But it's gone hand in hand with far from better results and more settled students and more harmonious communities to more disturbed communities. You touched on it. We're seeing it amongst our young people, record levels of anxiety and depression and self-harm. These programs are not working. And I wonder whether in part it's because we just aren't giving our children a decent narrative. They have no story in the first place and no means by which they are encouraged to see one another as of intrinsic value. In fact, the whole concept of identity politics seems to fly against what the state and its education departments, loosely defined, are trying to impose on our children. Yeah, no, that, that that's something that we really try to hit the the mental health aspect of it hard, partially because I'm I'm passionate about it, but partially because we sincerely believe that a lot of these uh, ways of thinking, but also these ideologies are devastating to mental health. So if you take kind of like how stressful social media is, even without ideology, um, it's very easy to get what is now called canceled, that essentially you say the wrong yeah, thing. Yeah. And next thing you know, they're demanding that you get kicked out of your high school, get uh, get punished, uh, get kicked out of um, high, whatever university you're at, get kicked out of your job. Um, so it, it, it creates a very tense situation, even without the hot ideology, um, just the sort of gotcha uh, element of it, that all these dumb things that we would say or do when we were younger, or at least, you know, in some cases, dumb things um, that uh, really went nowhere. Suddenly, if, if your bad joke goes viral, you could that could be it for you, or at least for at a um, you know at a particular institution, for, uh, for example. And we really started to see that, uh, that the, the social media turn turn nasty in like 2012, 2013. But add on to that that kind of that kind of um, perilous kind of situation. You add on the ferocious competition to get into these elite schools in the sense that people are being left behind. But you add on top of it an ideology that's just as so bleak and hopeless. Um, as the current sort of form of social justice, uh, why wouldn't you expect people to be depressed? And and I see it actually as a little bit of almost kind of cruelty. It, if you know that students are coming in um, with high rates of suicide, high rates of anxiety and depression, to tell them that they are part of an oppression matrix where practically all of them are um, are, are oppressors, um, because really, if you look at the ideology, almost everybody is an oppressor, at least to someone. Yeah. And also a victim. Yes. That's the interesting thing. Almost everybody in some way in their life has also been a victim. Yeah. And that essentially the only things you can do about this are fixation on language, that they're admitting your guilt about becoming an ally. There, it, it, uh, but, there, but ultimately, you, it's something you can't really fix. It's a very bleak outlook. And of course, when it comes to things you could be proud of, but anything from uh, everything, pr everything's problematized. And it, the idea that you, you, you should be shocked that people feel miserable in a circumstance where you're giving them such a bleak worldview, um, they really shouldn't be surprised. And then you add to that uh, climate change catastrophism. I'm not for a moment, please don't anybody hear, anyone hear me say, I'm not saying it's important, but the catastrophism that's built up into such a sort of, oh, the children understand how serious it is. We're all going to die. What's wrong with the adults? Uh, we see a lot of that in Australia. And the children we know now, many of them feel, well, I'm going to die anyway. Um, and even the worst predictions uh, from uh, the international experts hardly support that thesis. More difficult, challenging, worrying, but we kill hope. We kill hope. Yeah. And it sounds like, a, you know, an issue that we both take seriously. And one thing that I find frustrating about it is that the idea of like, so what can we do? <laughs> you know, like I'm, yeah. I'm big on nuclear power, for example. I'm big on uh, we're trying to get fusion to work. I'm, there, there are actually solutions to this. But I, I just finished a good book um, by uh, Martin Gurry. Uh, we come from different political standpoints. But he, he makes the point that globally, social media, the fifth wave, um, really uh, is only capable, at least at this point, of negation. It's only capable of sort of tearing things down. And if you look at that 
from the point of view of 2011, a lot more stuff start, starts to starts to make sense. And so, and that's one of the reasons why real issues like global warming, you know, like if, the idea that um, if you can only tear things down, then when people offer positive solutions, that gets that gets torn down too. And what are you left with? Just a constant state of crisis. Yeah, uh, I, it, it's a trite thing to say, but it seems to me that one of the terrible things we've done, and I'm a mid baby boomer, uh, is is to uh, you know, really make our children the mincemeat in our culture wars. Mm -hmm. You uh, actually said a, you said a very interesting thing in a discussion with Brett uh, Weinstein, just sort of summarising this. You actually said something to the effect that inflicting woke ideology on students who are already well known to be experiencing high levels of depression and anxiety uh, is actually incredibly irresponsible, which I think is what I'm saying as well. But um, do you have any further observations to make there? It seems to me that one of the really noticeable aspects of postmodernism as in its latest form, critical theory, is that there's an assumption, particularly in the West, that everything that's been done before us has, has been wrong, that we're never capable of making progress. And presumably that's because we're, you know, Critical theory theorists would argue that the system's so rotten, you can never concede it's done anything right, because that would say, well, it's not completely rotten. It may be possible that it can be redeemed, and they don't want that avenue open to young people, which adds to the despair. They're left feeling that the system is ho so hopeless, we've got to find something else, but how could you ever find something better? Yeah. Well, and, and, and what you're getting at is inherent in our, our three great untruths in the book. But essentially, yeah. what we argue in the book is that it's as if we're teaching a generation of students um, and, and of citizens very dysfunctional lessons, lessons that, that when said aloud, you'd be like, well, that sounds ridiculous. And one of them is your feelings are always right, which is the yeah. one that has, has the most sort of attractiveness because it sounds initially, if you don't really think about it, not that bad. Um, but it is bad because one of the things that you learn from, you know, uh, dealing with anxiety and depression is how to, you know, talk back to your feelings and how to, uh, how, how to make them not the boss of you. Um, so th that's yeah. probably the most attractive one. What doesn't kill you makes you weaker, um, is another thing that we talk about as being a great untruth. This idea that telling students that, oh, by the way, um, the world is filled with things that will permanently harm you. Um, and they could also just be ideas or speech and they may not harm you, but they could harm these people over here forever. And there's nothing that can be done about it. And of course that ignores a lot of, um, phenomena like, uh, um, uh, post-traumatic growth, you know, w which is something that gets discussed that a lot of people actually get through traumatic events with a sense of, uh, of competence, a sense of power, but it completely leaves that out. And then the last one um, that the anti-bullying, uh, you know, message I think I think actually really t turned turned the temperature way up, but also American political polarization, of course, did too, um, is that life is a battle between good people and evil people, and I think this speaks to something like deep in our hearts that want that battle, that want that that good versus evil uh, battle. But of course, when you look at the world that way, that's also pretty bleak, um, and it means that. And when you look at all the rules that you have, uh, you know, when it comes to social justice, when it comes to sort of campus ideology, that means your brother is the enemy. That means your dad might be the enemy. That might mean your best friend's suddenly the enemy. Um, so th it, it's incredibly sad. Um, but if I were to add one, um, like an underlying untruth, one of the things I've been playing with is the idea that the truth is easily known um, and largely known. Because social justice has this, the, the, well, when I talk about social justice, I am largely talking about, um, you know, the way it's described by Helen Pluckrose, you know, in, in yeah, her book, yeah. Cynical Theories, um, which I, I, even though I've heard, heard critiques of it, I've never heard that it's substantively, you know, uh, in, in, incorrect on any of this stuff. Um, and this, uh, this uh, kind of very deep theory of everything that really, frankly, has no basis in research, but nonetheless is, you know, obsession with language is, is all that matters. Um, everything's in decline. Uh, uh, it's all about power and privilege. Um, it's really, honestly, like not a particularly sophisticated theory. It's, it is an oversimplification of everything about humanity, uh, which people in, from the 1950s, 60s, and 70s came up with 
because they thought what that was the lowest point of human history. So the idea that um, uh, the idea that some of these postmodernist theorists looked at you know American society in in, in the fifties, sixties, and seventies and said this is the absolute nadir of human civilization, and we have to bash materialism and we have to get at the uh, underlying evil uh, within our society. It just seems strange for any student of history to really think of like, don't you think maybe 100 years before that or 200 years before that was a worse time than we currently live in? So we have people Mm -hmm. living in times that our grandparents would have been blown away by the uh, convenience and luxury that we enjoy. Um, And we but we also have convinced ourselves it's the worst possible time to be alive. It is extraordinary. Uh, and the other thing that, well, there's so many things we could talk about there. Uh, but the other thing that seems so bleak about it is that this idea that um, uh, if life's a battle between good people and bad people, then you, then you have to set yourself up as a good person. You're hardly going to set yourself up as part of the problem. Uh, and before you know it, you're in territory where you lack self-awareness uh, and any, any sort of awareness of your own failings. And, re- and far from helping people's mental health, that seems to damage it. Worse than that, perhaps, is that you lose the capacity for genuine identification with other people as opposed to concocted identity in an empathy age, um, uh, empathy rather, in an empathy age, and you become very unforgiving, very intolerant. Tolerance is meant to be you know, one of the great values of the age, but it strikes me that we could hardly be less tolerant. That critical theory is a doctrine of unbelievable intolerance where there's almost no place if there's any for forgiveness unless you do a complete groveling mea culpa and fall completely in line. And, of course, there's very little prospect of forgiveness, uh, forgetting and just moving on. It's always capable to bring things up against people in the, in an age when everything's recorded against you. Yeah, no, that that's absolutely true. It, it there, there there's uh, and it teaches a kind of dismissiveness over most of the population of the planet. Um, while at the same time talking about things like you know tolerance and and, and compassion and, and inclusivity, um, it gives you sort of a cartoon version of what your uh, fellow human beings are like. And when you look at some of the recent studies of empathy among younger people, um, you know, a lot of them, uh, at least the ones that I've seen, seem to indicate that empathy has actually gone down, which is surprising when you explain to to the students, when you explain this to them, like, well, but we're trying to be more inclusive than ever. I'm like, yes, but what do you actually think about your literal neighbor now? Um, what do you think about your, you know, that, that your uncle or aunt um, that, that, that gets mouthy at, at, at Thanksgiving? And it tends to be this very oversimplified narrative of them being evil and you being may be good. Uh, and, and of course, like when you get deep into the ideology, it, it, it is a state where you, the most you could ever hope to be is maybe good-ish. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.